All right, guys, welcome back to the Freelance Fairy Tales podcast, where we chat all things remote work, freelancing, mindset, and financial freedom. This week, I'm very excited to welcome on money and mindset coach Zoe Berghoff, who caught my attention on TikTok with her insanely informative Airbnb videos that I may or may not be using while I launch my own Airbnb side hustle. <laughs> Zoe helps individuals start their journey to Airbnb ownership so they can build generational wealth and leverage passive income. You love to see it. She offers personalized Airbnb. Airbnb consulting and a 12 week personal finance class. I'm going to have you plug at the end that covers everything under the sun. So, Zoe, welcome to the show. Hello. I'm so excited to be here, guys. I'm going to pick your brain for my own personal gain in this episode right now. No, no everyone's going to want to hear this. Um, yeah. Okay. So, Airbnb is like the hottest thing ever right now. Everybody wants in. Everybody wants to know more about it. They want to know how they can get in on the action. The market's exploding. So, before we get into the specifics of it, how did you first get started on Airbnb? Yeah. So, it's a funny story, actually. About 16 months ago, we. I actually, we were living in a yurt, which is a unique glamping experience. So it's kind of like a glamorized tent. And I had this idea where I was like, we should just like rent this on the weekends because we like to go tent in our rooftop tent and go camping and it's vacant. And I wish I remembered more about the conversation of like putting it up, but we yeah. literally, it was as easy as taking photos and we put it up and within two weeks we had a booking. And that's when we really were like, okay, now what? Like, what do we do yeah. with Airbnb management? And I like to tell that story because it shows people you don't have to have it all figured out to start Airbnb. No. I wish some of the tips and tricks that I now share with people we knew from the beginning, but it mm -hmm. really started from there. And then six months down the road, we put our second property up. So in the last 16 months, it's really become like, a full-time business for us, but it really started with just like a quick weekend rental idea. That's awesome. Did you guys build the yurt yourselves or did you buy it? Yep. So um, the yurt was built, well, it was obviously bought. The yurt comes in a huge rectangle, you know, shipping, oh, okay. you know, like it comes like together. Yeah. And then within 72 hours, it was built completely to structure. Um, and there's a lot of differences within yurts around the country. So, you know, the structures they're on, are they on decks? Are they on just level ground? So yeah, it was built by us. And it, ours is unique because it can be all year round. It does have a kitchen mm. and bathroom and shower, um, and not all year. Okay. Often, so. Okay. I'm I'm one of those classic Airbnb users where if I go somewhere and there's like a yurt or something, I'm gonna pick that over the apartment because why not? Like exactly, it is. <laughs> actually really, I mean, yeah, it's so true. We have a traditional home and a yurt, and last month the yurt surpassed the traditional home and in income. So it's pretty crazy what people will pay for a glamorized glamping experience for a weekend. And the initial investment yeah. of a glamping experience is very feasible to pay in cash. It's way less than what a traditional home would be. So it's on the, you know, it's on the rise. <laughs> yeah, I mean... You know, with the glamping thing, I would love to get into that too, but I feel like um, what stops me is all the permitting that I imagine goes into yeah. having like a glamping experience approved. Do you have any like tips for that? Really just yeah. you gotta do all your homework? Yeah, so we encourage people to do all of the initial research before you ever buy or invest in that yeah. land. The normal route of glamping is likely you buy the land and then you're putting the structure on the land you can own it yourself or you can rent it from someone, but you have to find that someone with that land. Mm -hmm. We have had two instances in the last six months where we have found land that we really liked and wanted to buy. We literally went and visited it and everything. Um, and before we ever invest in a piece of land, we call the county, we tell them what we wanna do. They are pretty straight up with you and they'll tell you like, yeah, you can do that, but you need to have a camping permit or you need to have this mm. permit or it can't be more than two structures on five acres. So they'll tell you, you know, what's the legal limits within that county or city. You do sometimes have to go, you know, in areas that aren't as popular, but that's also the experience of glamping. So national parks, you mm -hmm. know, it's kind of like, out their areas. They're not yeah. as harsh as big cities would be. But do your research, ask the questions, tell them what you want to do, even if you're not sure if it's a storage container house or a yurt, and be very sure that it's legal and permitted correctly. Because some instances, if you do not have the correct mm -hmm. permitting and they find you, 
whether someone turns you in or you're on Airbnb, um, you can be fined up to $10,000 a night with people in that house. That's not legal. So it's not only your own protection, but a financial protection. So I would definitely encourage you, like, do the homework, do the research, ask the questions. I feel like that's the part nobody wants to do, right? All the homework and the government websites and calling up the county. Everyone's like, how can we get around that part? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But I always say, like, the more research you do with Airbnb, the better investment and better educated you can be when you make that purchase. So it's worth it. But it is a lot of research. Yeah. So in that arrangement, you would say to someone, go, you know, find the right land that you know is going to permit it, yep. buy the land, yep. and then you would buy the yurt or the TP or whatever it is yep. in a prefab thing and it just gets shipped to you and boom? Yeah, there's tons of companies out there that do these glamping experiences, which is really cool. I know someone who bought a yurt and they were able to contract it for like, 12, 15,000 and it was built out within a month. So if you don't have those like handyman skills, there are people that can do these things for you. You can buy storage mm-hmm. container houses for, you know, 75,000 and it's completely done for you. Or you can save the cost and do some of the labor yourself. But since it's a growing industry, finding that TP, a renovated Airstream, a year, there's so many different ways. You really can yeah. find a company that works for you and with you. That's what I would be doing because I am not doing the manual labor to set up a yurt, (laughs) nor would I be good at it, I don't think. (laughs) Yeah, it definitely takes some time. (laughs) Yeah, no, for sure. So you said, okay, so you have two listings right now. So is this what you do full time? This is not my full time job. I like to tell people that Airbnb, I mean, maybe when you get to four or five listings, it's full time work or full time income Mm -hmm. for you. But with two listings, it's probably like one to five hours a week of our time. There are two of us that kind of jump on the listings. But to be honest, I do more of the management communication side. And he does more of like, you know, if there's maintenance or issues with the actual structure. So it takes one to five hours of my time a week. It has produced full-time income. But I do not Mm. find the need to just sit around all week and do different things you know, yeah. for five hours of work and getting paid. So I, I do other things in addition to Airbnb. That's awesome. So for you, it's a side hustle for now. Yeah, it definitely know? is. Yeah. And we do plan to grow and expand where it could be a full-time workload or job. But that's the coolest thing about Airbnb is the payout is full-time income potential, but the workload is nowhere near 40 hours a week, unless you're in that like starting phase of building or something like that. Yeah, that's amazing, guys who are listening to this, because I have a lot of people who follow me for freelancing, obviously, which Mm -hmm. can be time consuming to make good money at it. And they all want to know what's some ways my money can work for me in the background while I'm running my freelancing business, Airbnb. Now, for the people listening, I always hear this misconception. They're like, I don't have enough money. I don't have 50K in my bank account. I can't do it. So, and I always see you guys have the best video responses to this. But what would you say to the person who, who thinks they need 50K to do this? Yes. Um, Well, not everyone who's in Airbnb has had $50,000 in cash to invest. So there's cool ways to work with Airbnb nowadays where you can do co-hosting for literally zero dollars. Like you can start today Mm -hmm. if you guys want to. So that's basically the management of someone else's property that they own it, they invested in it, but they don't want to do the day-to-day management. So they are going to pay you a percent of that monthly rental income and you are going to do that for them. The coolest thing about co-hosting is before you make that big investment into Airbnb, you can figure out if you actually like it and you like the hospitality yeah. industry. And I mean, it's as simple as you find those hosts and I can talk on that too. You message them and you just need that one phone call with someone to start that side hustle. And co-hosting could bring in, depending on the house's monthly rental income, you know, like one to 3000 a month, little more, a little less. So it's pretty cool. There's also rental um, Airbnb arbitrage. So you sign a lease and you are mm-hmm. able to, in the contract, it's legal for you to short-term rental that apartment or that condo or that house. And you are signing to pay that lease every month. It's going on Airbnb and whatever you make in addition, you are taking home as profit or for your expenses. So I, as you guys probably know, you don't need to have 50000 to get an apartment or condo. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you might, I suggest like security deposit, first month's rent, 
And maybe you have the first three months set aside in case those bookings are slow. You are not putting yourself out financially by starting that Airbnb venture. So you don't need 50,000. <laughs> yeah. No, no, brilliant. Okay, so yeah, where would one go find somebody who owns a property who's looking for yep. a co-host Airbnb it for them? Yeah, so I think one day in the future, I'm not sure if this will be the case, but I do think Airbnb may have like a co-hosting, you know, like oh, board sure. or marketplace. Like mm -hmm. you need a co-hoster, here's all our co-hosters. You need a host, here's your host. Yeah. Right now that's not the case. So I do encourage people, you'd be surprised what word of mouth can do for you. So just yeah. by telling, talking about Airbnbs in our community, I know probably five families that have Airbnbs that would never have told me, but because I brought it up, they said, oh, we do that too. So word of mouth can go pretty far for you, friends and family. If you are not in that situation where you really know someone in your network with an Airbnb home, I do encourage you to start networking just like freelancing. Mm -hmm. You know, no client is going to come right to your door. It's just no freelancing right. world is like that and neither with Airbnb hosting. So join those Facebook mark or Facebook groups that are yeah. real estate oriented. In the community, they have Facebook groups like just where people post about what's going on, Airbnb Facebook groups. And the coolest thing about co-hosting is you don't have to be in the area. So you can literally do this anywhere in the world, anywhere in the country. You don't have to live in that town. And start pitching yourself. Start deciding what services you're going to offer. Come up with that template pitch you want to send to people. And I have people I work with who they will message 10 people and two of them already are willing to get on a call with them. And the rest have said, yeah. you know, maybe in the future, not quite yet. So there's quite a few places you just need to get creative, just like freelancing. Yeah, I mean, it, it only makes sense, right? If somebody's sitting on a property somewhere and they're paying the mortgage mm -hmm. for it and they're like, hey, I'd love to not pay this mortgage, but still own this house. Like, yep. I feel like it's almost a matter of just sharing the education of this with them. They'd be like, oh, I'm so down. <laughs> like, yeah, the coolest thing is a lot of people I work with who want to co-host and pitch themselves to a host, I tell them the host doesn't even realize this is a thing you can offer. Like, hosts, exactly. Hosts are not usually 20, 30 years old. They're people who have acquired multiple homes. They do this just for some additional income. It's not their main focus. They don't even realize co-hosting is an option mm -hmm. for them to have. And who doesn't want extra help when it comes to messaging people at 10 p.m. on a Saturday? Because that will happen. <laughs> so you need to be yeah. that responsive co-hoster for that host so they don't have to worry about it. I know. I mean, I, before TikTok, I would not have ever known about Airbnb arbitrage or this co-hosting mm -hmm. arrangement. You just wouldn't know it. And with the Airbnb arbitrage, I've been kind of putting my yeah. feelers out there. I put on my Instagram story. I'm like, hey, any landlords out there, any people who uh, who want to sign off on this? Now, I think people might think to themselves, oh, that sounds easier said than done, that you get someone yeah. to write into yeah. the lease that you're going to Airbnb the property. Is this even real? And yeah. what would you say to that? <laughs> Yeah, so I actually saw a video about this the other day, and if someone has this apartment, they may not want to go through the trouble or the turnover, Airbnb will carry on. Like It does have yeah. turnover every single week or month. So to them, having that lease paid every single month guaranteed your name is on that contract that you will pay that no matter what, and that's more important to them is having that paid for than dealing with the cleaning and the turning over and people coming in and out. Like if you're guaranteeing it's gonna look this way in a year, it's not gonna have any damage, I'm gonna pay you the amount you're asking, some people will say, I deal, like I'm sold. If you wanna Airbnb it and deal with the trouble, go ahead. And Airbnb arbitrage is a thing. Like people are talking about it because yeah. people are doing it. So if you say it's not possible, it's like, well, there's people out there doing it and it's a really cool way to add a property into your portfolio without having to buy a home or build something. I mean, I think that is so cool that people can get in on this without buying any property, right? Like that's so yeah. 2021 to me and I love that. I got, when I first posted about Airbnb on my TikTok, I got ripped to shreds in the comment section yeah. saying landlordship is not a vibe. You know, oh, you yeah. live so long, you become yeah. the villain in your own story. I got a lot of that. I was like, okay, yawn. Like, you know, all this crazy stuff. Meanwhile, we're talking about two different arrangements right now where you can get in on this market without even buying anything. Exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
I guess, what would you say to someone who says landlordship is not a vibe? I actually, I had a money coach on a couple hours ago. I asked her that same question and she was like, I would tell them to go away because that's how you build generational wealth. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I get, um, I think Airbnb brings some controversy and I get the comments, the positive and the negative of, you know, yeah. you're running out of people. They can't have houses to live in that area and work and it's all becoming rentals. But I do think those people you haven't seen, one home is not disrupting an entire community. It's a community right. issue, if that's the case. And I sometimes tell people like, you know, if I had 10 of these, yeah, I can see what you're talking about. But like one home is not going to completely disrupt the industry. The cool thing is, is during slow season, you can do long-term rentals. And we've had instances where we've hosted someone for a month or two months during a slow season at a normal rate for the community and let them live in the home. And we were right. helping that long-term housing. I also think those people with the negative comments, like you will never do something right for them. Like not, you, you, anything you do is not enough. No. Um, and it's, yeah, it's building generational wealth. And it's also, you know, it's just a new way to use a house and offer it to a family to use it in an experience that they're going to remember forever. Just like, I mean, do you go to hotels and say that? Like, it's the same. I know. Ordeal. So you, you'll never make I'm this. Like, I can't help it. Yeah. Like, I can't. I'm like, do you write that comment under like JLo's Instagram post? Because I can bet yeah. she owns about 80 houses that displace probably millions of people. I'm over here with one house and yeah. you're like coming for me. Exactly. I think, like, if you think about the economic repercussions of it, right? Like, let's say you buy land in town that nobody was going to use on, like, the outskirts mm -hmm. of the town. It's, like, all forested, and you put a yurt on it, okay? Yeah. That wasn't a house. Yeah. That wasn't displacing anyone. Yeah. You just created now, a po you know, actually a affordable long-term housing solution that's going to bring people into the town where they're going to spend their money in town. Exactly. And everyone's exactly. businesses prosper, and it's all good. Yeah, it's actually that's how I love it. It's so true. People comment on our videos sometimes and our year and home were built. So we provided an additional house for the area that wasn't here before. It was vacant land. There's 35 acres yeah. that no one had built on. And we've done the long-term rental game. Like we've housed a family for two years in our house and we've done Airbnb. So it is true. You're bringing yeah. additional homes and structures in the area. And, you know, these people who are complaining that like, you know, I can't live here and work here. It's like, your work is, you know, tourists are providing your work and the yeah. ones paying you at the end of the day. So it's a unique um, industry and there's a lot of, you know, thoughts and opinions about it, but there's positives and negatives to everything. So I really think sure. if you believe that you're helping people and you're paying your mortgage, you're helping families and guests, keep doing what you're doing. But if you do feel some negative connotation about it, then maybe you need to reevaluate your situation. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, okay, I have that. People love asking about Airbnb horror stories, I think, because it almost makes them oh chuckle. My. Have you ever had someone just refuse to leave? Just say, no, I'm not we leaving. We've never had that issue. In 16 okay. months, I know like the squatter thing, people are like, I'm nervous and afraid of squatters. Never have we had that issue. Okay. Um, we've never had issues with someone coming into the home when they're not welcome. That is definitely a horror story times 10 that people, like when you hear those, they have never been a reality for us. Um, I do think your price point of your Airbnb may affect if you deal with that issue or not. But for the okay. area and the price we're in and the income level that most people are to book here, it's never been a reality. But I know someone who has a more inexpensive Airbnb in a different city, bigger city, a lot of different people are in it. And they've had some horror stories and issues of people trying to get their money back and sending YouTube yeah. videos and claiming that was happening out front of the house and it was a YouTube video. So <laughs> you just need to uh. screen your guests, you know, protect yourself, protect, protect your house. And, you know, we can only use our best judgment when we're in those situations. But squatters have never been an issue for us. Yeah, it, you know, it's funny because it's there's almost like a crossover of that into freelancing. Everyone who freelances yep. knows you get those horror clients that come out of nowhere. They they seem all nice. You write the press release for them. They get it. And they're like, this effing sucks. I want my money back. And you're like, what? Like, yeah. what are you talking about? You were fine the whole time. And I just feel like there's no business where you can avoid that today. I mean, mm -hmm. I just think that's part of business in a way. Yeah. So you've given, I, I've seen on yours really good tips 
to anticipate people being crazy, <laughs> to have photos sent after the cleaners are done, right? To like uh, yes. to protect yourself. Yeah, we've actually that was a learned lesson tip that I give. So mm. we okay weren't always doing that. And by chance, this is kind of how I tell people, like if you're working with a new cleaning team and you're not sure of their level of cleanliness and your standards, I started asking our cleaning team for photos or videos. And when they sent those, I would pay them. So I kind of just, you know, told them like, once those come over, I know the job's done, you'll get paid. I see. We, and we actually had a guest who came into the home and accused us that it was nowhere near pictured what it was on the listing. Like mm -hmm. the couch is different. And he said like, you know, you have four plates for a six person house, which I was like, that is the weakest excuse. Like use something else, <laughs> like plates. Oh my God. So, that was a big booking for us. It was over 2000 for a week and we were actually on vacation during this whole ordeal. So this just shows like it will happen at any time. And the case escalated to Airbnb because I was like, we are not, you know, our cancellation policy is not to refund day of. Like you have checked in. Yeah. If it was, you know, within the cancellation policy, I would, but it was not. So it escalated to Airbnb and that's when they start to collect proof from both parties. So I had proof of text messages of him threatening to leave negative reviews. And he was like, if you don't refund, I'm going to leave negative reviews. I'm a small business owner, which you cannot threaten a host with negative reviews. No. That is not allowed. So I had screenshots of that. And I also had the video of our cleaner, which showed the condition of the home. So by him mm. accusing us that the home was not pictured as it was, I could say, here's the photos and the videos of what it looks like yeah. at 2.30 when he checked in at 3. And here's the listing. And they deemed us, it was an eight-week case. This just shows there's good and bad to Airbnb. But it was an eight-week mm -hmm. case. And they deemed that we won the case and got to keep the entire reservation without him ever staying in it. But you know, that whole day he was calling us and saying like, you need to refund me right now. I have nowhere to go. And that's where as a host, you need to use your best judgment, but you also need to protect yourself. And that cancellation policy is in place for a reason like those situations may bring. So yes. that was a learned tip to always get photos mm. and videos from cleaners. And it helps you make sure they're doing the job correct. <laughs> Totally. I think that's a brilliant tip. I followed that tip with starting <laughs> mine because I was like, that's so smart. Yeah. Would you say that Airbnb is fair with, do they side with the hosts a lot? Because um, for Fiverr, you know, where my people yeah. are, Fiverr is very unfair to the sellers, pretty much never sides with the seller, even if it's blatantly the buyer's fault. It's always with the buyer, always, always. Mm -hmm. So does Airbnb, are they more fair with that? I, every say? situation I've had with Airbnb, they are. I think they are are very fair in terms of you know what proof and what evidence do we have and it gets escalated I think that's where as a host like the cleaning pictures and if a guest texts you outside of the platform like threatening or in any way you screenshot that like you need yeah. all the evidence you can but I have had no issues with Airbnb and siding with myself and you know who's correct in the position I do encourage people like Airbnb is a business and they need to protect themselves so if there's instances where I'll give you a situation from it, um, if a guest damages your home, you can submit a damage request and Airbnb being the platform they are, they will insure you up to like $1 million depending on the situation, which means if the guest does not agree to pay for the damage, Airbnb will survey the case and decide if it's worthy of them paying for it. So I had a situation where I submitted a damage. It was like $500. So it was like a decent amount where the guest was like not happening. And because I submitted the damage request at 315, Airbnb would maybe be willing to cover it. But because we had another guest check in at 3 p.m., that damage request was no longer current with the past reservation. So they were telling me, we will not cover this because you now have a new guest in your home. So we can't be sure who did this damage. So I was fighting over like 15 minutes with them, but I was just like, that was something I wouldn't have known without learning okay. it. So that's where I suggest like, you need to follow the Airbnb guidelines for them to protect you in those instances. So that was just, you know, an instance where I was like, okay, well, we can now like charge security deposits if we want, which we did for a week. And then we decided like it wasn't, 
working that well for us. But in every instance, Airbnb has protected the right side, I guess I'll say. So you would say in that case, if there's damage to the property, don't have a new guest come in yet. Like leave it basically. Yeah, so I should have requested, like submitted the deposit and damage, you know, proof early that day, like earlier. But we had, this was in the peak of summer. So like 10 a.m. checkout, 3 p.m. check-in with a new guest. So I did not know I was working with like legit minutes to get Airbnb to approve it or disapprove it. But if it is something substantially damaged, um, you know, I go on there and I see like my house is burned down, which I cannot imagine that situation. If it is substantial, I would contact the upcoming guests and try to accommodate, reschedule them, give them a voucher for this money if they can't cancel, something like that bigger of a damage situation. I've never had that, but it's definitely a thing, I'm sure. So Airbnb is always like, you know, called, answered right away when needed. So that could be something in that situation. That's good to know. Um, All right, so if someone's listening to this and they want to get in on the action, they're starting at square one, they would probably ask, where do I look for one? I know that's a really big, like, open-ended question. And I know you can look online at, like, the top Airbnb markets and stuff, but are there any particular, like, pockets in the country or in the world Mm or, uh, you know, a particular part of a city you'd recommend? Yeah, so this is probably my most common question. Every call I do with someone interested in Airbnb, that's the first question. And I have a few answers for those wondering where to get started. So I do personally feel that like you are owning this house. So hopefully once in a lifetime, you get to actually enjoy it, whether it's a week, a year or weekend, like buy where you like. If this is solely a business Mm -hmm. mindset, then maybe you don't care at all about where the location is. But personally, like we look at places that we like for a reason and we would want to go and we would want to own because at the end of the day, when that mortgage is paid off, this is your place. Yeah. So I do encourage that. Like, what is this for you? Is this a personal use or is this just solely business? In addition, there are some helpful research sites. I'm sure you may have heard of them, but AirDNA is helpful in terms of the nightly average. Why this is helpful is when you start to get those areas in mind, you will be able to start seeing what those house values are or what that land commitment looks like in terms of financials. So when you look at those nightly averages on AirDNA, you will be able to gauge can I pay my mortgage in 10 days in this area? If the average is 419 and then 119, that's going to look a lot different in terms of your investment and profits that you're making. There's also Mash Visor is interesting. If you have the paid version, it will tell you what the expected Airbnb income will be produced from that home, like in each home where they're listed, what the averages are, how much they might produce for you. That is like amazing. Um, That's pretty valuable information. I also tell people, you know, that there's the obvious areas of like, beaches and mountains, national parks are growing huge because there really aren't hotels fit for national parks quite yet. So Williams, Arizona, there's barely anywhere to stay to visit one of the biggest national parks, the Grand Canyon in the country. So you're going to start to see camping experiences show up there. You know, there's obviously the tourist towns and the vacation towns. I do suggest like be mindful. How far are you from an airport? Would people pay to get on an airplane to come to your area and stay there. But that being said, you don't have to have an Airbnb in a really popular upcoming area. Airbnbs Mm -hmm. work all over the country. So I would take that into account. And I also tell people like the actual Airbnb platform is highly, highly underrated. We competitively use the Airbnb platform every single week to get insights on pricing, up and coming areas, what the rates are looking like in certain areas, There was an instance where we almost bought in a town and we decided to look on Airbnb what was offered and there was one home on Airbnb in that town. And we were like, that could either be really good or really bad. So I think people need to start thinking of Airbnb, the actual site, as a resource as well for research when looking at where they want to buy. Yeah, when I set up my listing a couple weeks ago, I actually didn't realize it was going to take like two hours because it's so (laughs) extensive now. Because I've been using Airbnb as someone who's staying at them for like seven years. I was like a day Mm -hmm. one Airbnb user. Like I was using it back when people just had like one blurry picture and like a title and I could have probably been like killed or something. That's when I was using it. 
So when I was uploading it, I was like, wow, this site has come, like, this site is incredible. Like, the technology mm -hmm. on Airbnb in the actual platform is incredible. It really is. And I do encourage people to, you know, Airbnb is a business. They are not guaranteed to show your listing on the front page. Like, you got to play the game yeah. just like they are. So to every, I swear, every week or month, they're coming out with new platforms. Now there's on there, like, is your home wheelchair accessible? Is your door accessible? Like, show us proof. Show us mm. photos. Use every single option they have. Fill it all out. Spend the time, like you said, two hours. Yeah. And really revamp and create that listing. If you half-ass it, not sure if I can say that, but if you do, you are going to be yeah. able to... <laughs> you are going to notice that your bookings are going to show that you're not really using the platform to where they... They want you to use all those features. That's why they're there. So every you know two weeks, every month, I look at our listing and make sure it's utilizing all of the characters and all of the spots to fill out, just like you probably saw when you were filling yours out. Yeah, I mean, it's the same principle as when you're setting up on Fiverr. I can't tell you how many people will just like rush through their Fiverr profile and then wonder why they're not getting $1,000 clients. It's always the same concept. You gotta do your due diligence. You have to go slowly in the beginning. You have to research it. You have to make sure there's no typos. You have to have nice photos taken. Same thing on Fiverr, you know, it's, it's all the same game. Now, I know there's, you know, this, this, you could answer this over three hours, really, of how does one start an Airbnb business, and I know you have services to help people with this, but what would be your, like, if you summed it up, three steps, if someone was like, okay, I understand now, where to look, now what? What would mm -hmm. you say to them in a very general way? My three biggest tips is do your research. I think if you get anything out of this podcast, research is key, whether you're co-hosting or wanting to own. By doing your research, you're going to be able to make a more confident, educated purchase decision or client partnership with a co-hoster and host. So research is key. My next tip, and this is just the reality of Airbnb, is like you financially have to make sure it makes sense and works for you, especially if you're investing in a home. You need to make sure you've done your due diligence. What does my investment look like? People ask me all the mm -hmm. time. What are average expenses on a monthly basis, which really depends on the house. Our expenses yeah. can vary from $150 for a glamping experience and over $2,000 from home. So what are you expecting to invest in and what are your expected monthly expenses? You really need to be financially, which is why I started with personal financing and it turned into Airbnb and they really collaborate yeah. well together because you just have to. Like it, You know how it is. It takes a while to save sure. for that investment, but it's worth it. And you're buying a house here. It's like one of the biggest purchases people make in their whole life. So my third tip would be don't underestimate the power of learning and researching right now. Because by doing all of this work right now that a lot of people don't wanna do, you will be able to feel confident when that time comes and you'll know this is a good investment for myself and my future and generational wealth. And I think people really, they're like, well, I can't start. I can't buy something tomorrow. Not many of us can buy something tomorrow, but that right. doesn't mean you can't get started into Airbnb with co-hosting, arbitrage, and ownership. And by learning from others who are in the industry and listening to podcasts like this and you know, learning about real estate, you're really doing a lot of work that you don't credit yourself for. And yeah. you know a lot more this week than you did the week prior. So. I try to work with everyone and tell them like, you're on the right path, you're doing a good job. Even though you can't put a listing up tomorrow, it doesn't mean you're not well on your way to the Airbnb life. I love that. You're like, yeah, it's, it's money, mindset, Airbnb, like all rolled into one with your brand. Um, I absolutely love it. I have to ask, is there a third listing potentially on the way for you or not yet? There is. So we are, it is a weird time right now, which everyone I'm sure is aware of with housing and the housing market. But I will yeah. say our goals and future journey for Airbnb is to really tap into the glamping experience. And mm -hmm. this is a business and personal decision. We personally love to be outside and we love to be in nature and get away. If I had the choice to stay in our year or our house, I would pick the year. I love it so yeah. much because of the experience it provides and seeing the reviews people have, you know, they just, the people that get it, they get it and they love it. They're like, this was heaven on earth. And that's where I'm like, I'm so glad we share this with others and not just ourselves. Yeah. So down the road, we do foresee glamping experiences being a focus because the investment's a lot more realistic. The experience is one of a kind. And 
you know, we personally enjoy it more. But I will say with our Airbnb profits we make, we try to not touch them at all. So we don't use this as additional income for ourselves. We don't, you know, go to lunch on it. We pay for the expenses of the homes, renovations, and that's it. And it all gets put to the side for a future investment for a third property. So that's something I think people have a misconception with Airbnb that it's just like, you know, you use that money and you spend it however you want. But yeah. we're really treating it like a future investment for another portfolio addition to the Airbnb portfolio we do have. Beautiful, perfect personal <laughs> finance. I mean, that's that's what I did for really my first six years freelancing. I just saved it because I, I wanted to invest it when the time came. And now I feel like that time is finally here where I can start using the money that I've saved and invested with it. But I think a lot of people are like, oh, I want to go get a Lambo or whatever. And it's like, listen, you can all do whatever you want with your own money. But if you want to build wealth, you're going to have to hang on to it and keep investing it. Am I saying that right? I know you're the personal finance person. <laughs> I would 100% agree. I tell people like, do not get lost in what everyone else is doing and buying and don't buy what society is telling you unless it truly yeah. makes you happy. You know, you have to personal finance or business or Airbnb those finances need to be in 100% working order and they need to be organized and clear. I track my personal expenses every month, as do I with the Airbnb business. Every single purchase we've ever made for it is tracked and every income we've made is also tracked. And that's really going to be how you decide if your business is profitable and you can keep going or where you need to adjust. So I personally would rather build a savings account than a closet, but that's not for everyone. But I yeah. really think that takes like internal work to decide what's important to you and what makes you happy. Totally. This has been amazing. Let everyone know where can they work with you and where are you on social media? Yes. Yeah, so you can follow me on TikTok. This is like the Airbnb everything is TikTok. So it's just at Zoe Berghoff and Instagram as well. This is where you're going to see like the outdoor life of ours and the Airbnb world, just at Zoe Berghoff. And then if you are interested in an Airbnb consultation or a 12 week personal finance course with myself, you can find everything at my website, just zoeberghoff.com. Pretty simple. Um, and we really talk everything, personal finance, Airbnb investment, future real estate investments, and everything I teach and share is because I did it myself. So I only yeah. can teach others how to do things that I've done myself and learned from. So, yeah. I mean, I honestly, I may book your consultation. I'm not kidding. In the next few months or so <laughs> as my stuff starts to build out. I always say to people when they see that I sell online courses, they're like scammer. I'm like, you guys don't understand. I actually take other people's online courses and I book their consultations. Mm -hmm. Like it's a knowledge exchange. You can't get all angry about it. Exactly. Yeah, we actually have a glamping Airbnb like 101 and everything you need to know course coming because it's such a okay. yeah it's such a new industry and honestly my boyfriend he is the king of finding land and building like he has the master vision and I tell him like that's yeah. feasible or not <laughs> um, so that is coming yeah. soon so there's more things in the line for Airbnb you know help and everything but I work with people you know who are just interested in learning about it they're ready to invest they have airbnbs so there's really an array of different people that you can kind of fall into and work with myself so yeah okay i'm 100 percent gonna sign up. i'm sold <laughs> sold um before we sign off for anyone listening or whatever what what's your favorite motivational quote or something to leave them with on their journey yeah I have said this since I was in high school and it's really cool to see where it's like become but if you do not believe in yourself no one else will and I truly believe that so I would encourage you guys to simple but profound yeah, yeah like believe in your dreams and what you want for yourself because it's it'll happen I love it thank you Zoe yes thank you thank you guys <laughs>